Hi, um, this is Bess again, and we are back for part three of the QMMM lectures. So in the last part, we learned about um, one way to try to deal with um, partitioning over bonded interactions. And now we're going to look at uh, some more of the details of that, um, including how we, how we treat the uh, stretching terms, etc., across that partition. And we're also going to look at an example from the literature of um, one way to use the QMMM method. So first of all, um, remember that in the last slide we looked, in the last video, we looked at uh, a case where we we took mechanical embedding. So we said, well, like in analogy to uh, the unpolarized version of QMMM where we had non-bonded interactions, we're going to just partition the bond like uh, I showed here with this, this cartoon, and then we're going to use uh, corrections to the energy by computing the energy for the QM region at one level, the MM at another, and then subtracting the difference um, from the whole. Now, uh, in that case, we computed the QM region and it was unaffected by the presence of the MM region when we computed the uh, QM part alone. Likewise, the MM part was unaffected by the QM part. Um, you can imagine that we would want to include that polarization. And uh, one way that we can do this is uh, referred to as electrostatic embedding. So we're uh, going to extend the idea of having a polarized, unpolarized uh, partition for the non-bonded terms. Um, this, of course, will still be included. Uh, however, we're going to extend it and also include terms for the bonds cut along that boundary. So in this cartoon, we're going to figure out how we'll deal with treating the terms associated with the bond stretching uh, here and also angles that might cross the partition. So I briefly mentioned earlier that we uh, will cap the, the partitions with hydrogen atoms. So I used, again, this example with ethane, and, and I showed how we would cap uh, the QM partition, for example, with, with a hydrogen atom. Now, one thing that we should keep in mind is that this hydrogen atom is, in a sense, fictitious. It doesn't exist in the real system, and we're, we're placing it there to facilitate our partitioning, to facilitate the calculations we want to do. And so one thing that we don't want to do is compute the nuclear repulsion for the hydrogen atoms. And I've uh, put this term in a box here. So uh, the hydrogen atoms are not included in, in this sum uh, because we don't want to consider the repulsion with these, with these atoms since they're not really present in the system we're interested in. So how do we deal with other interactions aside from simply the, uh, the energy term? What, what we'll end up, what we'll do is have to consider terms that are very reminiscent of the force field part, right? So the bond stretching, angle bending, and torsions. Um, one choice that you could make that's commonly made is to say that the bond stretching will be treated like an MM potential. So uh, remember when we dealt with the non-bonded parts of the energy, we had to find epsilon and sigma values within that Leonard-Jones term, and we decided that even though these were QM atoms, we could assign the carbon and the hydrogen atoms their analogous uh, force field parameters. So we'll do the same thing here, where we'll assign the bond stretching for this bond that crosses the partition. Uh, we'll use the force constants from the MM potential. Um, likewise, we'll do that for the angle bending. So for the angle where we have this uh, carbon, or sorry, hydrogen, carbon, carbon bond, we'll treat that angle with the MM potential. Um, for the fictitious bond angles, so for example, if we if we consider this case where we have this angle involve angles involving the um, the hydrogen atom that's uh, our capping hydrogen atom. We're going to impose a very large force constant on those because we don't we don't want uh, we don't want them to contribute. Uh, finally, the the torsions will also use an MM potential, um, and we'll do this when we have a torsion that involves uh, two MM and two QM atoms, 
And also, I mean, in my cartoon, I don't have enough atoms in the MM region since ethane is small, but if we had a, an, a torsion that involved three MM and one QM, we would include that as well. Um, in some cases, the charges also need to be modified. Uh, people have found through experience that they might need to scale their charges uh, in order to get uh, better behavior. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, places in literature you can turn to to find examples of that, but just something to keep in mind. I suppose this is also an analogy with force field development where sometimes people will scale charges uh, for improved behavior as well. So um, I mentioned in the last video Kenji Morikuma. He is the uh, developer of Onion, and I wanted to do to show an example from the literature of a QMMM calculation to kind of emphasize some of the choices that have to be made and then the implications you might expect from them. Uh, we're not going to talk about this paper in uh, incredible detail. I just uh, have selected a couple of things to emphasize some points. So this is a paper from 2008 and um, in it they're interested in understanding uh, the reaction that is done by isopenicillin and synthase. So the reaction within this enzyme, uh, it has an iron active site, and you can see it'll bind oxygen, which then uh, reacts with these uh, nearby hydrogen atoms to form water and an oxo. And then, of course, this oxo in the next step here will be protonated to form water again. Um, and so you can see that this is a, a case where QMMM methods can be very useful because at the active site we not only have a transition metal, which uh, describing transition metals with uh, force fields, although it can be done, is, is difficult to parameterize. Um, we could treat this center at the density functional level of theory. In this case, they're using B3L by P. Um, and then, of course, we have these uh, this reaction occurring. So we're making and breaking bonds. So we really need to have a QM description uh, within, within the active site of the enzyme. However, it is an enzyme. So um, in this cartoon, we're only seeing uh, the, the active center. We're not, we're not seeing all the bulk of the enzyme around that we'll use amber to treat. So these are two images from the, from the manuscript where they show uh, the way that they've chosen the size of their QM space. They've tried actually two different choices. Um, in, in this image, the actual MM part is shown by these uh, ribbon-like depictions for the folding of the protein. Um, of course, remember, amber is an atomistic force field, so uh, there really are the full atom centers of the, of the protein, even though in the, in the image it's not depicted that way. Those are all treated at the molecular mechanics level. And then they try two different sizes for QM space. So in the ball and stick figure here, this is the smaller of their QM spaces where they tried to um, include only the active site. And so they call this the active site model. And then they also tried a larger one where they include these additional residues, the tyrosine and arginine serine residues and an additional water molecule. Um, also in the QM space, and they call the full model, which is shown here, the onion model. So the onion model is equivalent to the active site model, but with these additional groups that uh, perhaps they have found were, were nearby during the reaction and had some reason to think could affect the reactivity. And um, within the onion framework, they can optimize the geometry and what they've done here is overlay the two structures on top of each other. So in silver we have the smaller model and in the active site model and in blue we have the larger onion model and you can see within the active site area they get pretty good agreement uh, from the geometries uh, where you see the biggest difference is over here on this end. Um, and remember that's where our models differed. The active site model didn't have the additional groups here in the QM space. They were considered in the MM space, of course. But in the onion model, by adding those additional residues uh, to the QM region, they've uh, seen a change in the geometry that they observe um, within the QM space. Of course, uh, the presence of where this methyl group ends up being, uh, we certainly could expect it to affect how O2 binds and in turn reacts. So these are things that um, if you are going to go about doing a QM-MM calculation that you'll have to consider. And um, I suppose you can draw analogies to other 
other areas of computational chemistry um, where the user has to make a choice over the model. Um, we always have to be uh, very conscious that we're choosing a large enough model or that our model is representative of the chemistry we're trying to see. Um, and then in turn, thinking about uh, how those models might affect our results. So, um, so in this paper, they were, they were able to compare these spaces and then try to get a better understanding about what is important in the reactive pathway. And by looking at both the smaller and larger model, they can see uh, which steps along the reaction are most affected by not, not including the additional, um, the additional uh, residues in the QM space. And so this is the figure where they actually show uh, one of the pathways that they studied. And you can see that in gray is the smaller QM region and in blue is the larger. And there are some pretty significant deviations in that first, uh, in this first case, we see that uh, the first uh, state is, is much lower in energy than it should be in the active site model. And then in turn, the barrier is much higher uh, for the activation, that first step. Um, then when they use the larger UNEM model, um, I think also probably most importantly is how much further stabilized the product is when we when they use the larger um, UNEM model as opposed to the uh, active site model. Perhaps the additional res residues are playing some important role in stabilizing this, and that could be something that uh, that they would have looked into. Um, if you're interested, of course, you can turn to the paper. Uh, but the main the main point of the discussion was to really indicate that you could study these large systems and you can study the reactivity in an actual protein. Um, however, choosing choosing the region in which you um, treat as QM or MM um, is a very important choice, and you want to do so carefully and always taking care to to make comparisons between either other calculations or experimental data to try to validate your choice. Um, and you can always test, uh, like do like they did, where you test several um, options, and then from that decide what uh, is most important in your chemistry. So uh, that's the end of the QMM lectures.